Let me try something one more time, at the very least, about the three activities going on that I have of late labeled simply C, D, and E, and I referred to as forces, persuasions, possibilities, and pointed out to you very correctly that in as much as for anything to occur, not being very metaphysical at all, for anything to occur, for me to stand up here, for me to talk, for you to listen, for you to fall in love, for you to have the desire to punch someone out, for you to daydream about world conditions, for you to fear that you're going to die, for anything to happen, for you at any ordinary level to perceive that there is something happening in life. There are three parts to it. It is as though it were a three-legged stool, a three-legged chair. It is a three-legged occurrence, a three-legged situation. If it's any less than that, for all intents and purposes, it does not exist. You might as well forget it because you will not see it. You will not feel it. You will not hear it. You will not smell it. You will not think about it. What I have been referring to as triads, that there must be a triad, even though it appears that anybody can say, I have this situation between my girlfriend and me. It is not a situation between you two or for someone to say, I have this problem between my employer and me. And it appears that that's it, my employer or my manager. It's him and it's me. Nobody else is involved. My problem is between my girlfriend, my boyfriend, and me. That's it. There are no in-laws. There's no third party. But the problem is quite simple. The situation is quite simple. It's two people, and that's never true. I want to get back into it and try and drag you back into it some. It is not some metaphysical theory that I simply conjured up, and it is not something to play with the rest of your life. If you indeed undergo a kind of conversion, if indeed you can, in your own case, activate the nervous system of where it is now, without thinking about it, in the ordinary sense, you will begin to be conscious in a triaxial manner. You have to be. You'll have no choice. If you had not run across me, if it had been a different time and a different place and you had fallen in with some other group at some other time, uh, I assure you, if it was operating at this intensity, if life had this kind of interest at heart at that time and place, there would have been some variation of this. Not necessarily using my terms or my maps. All so-called spiritual heroes, anybody you ever imagined, was able to think not in a binary sense. They were able to be conscious, not in the sense of a yin-yang, positive, negative, active, pas passive kind of consciousness of them having ideas, think, notions the way life should be, and then some sort of perception that things are not this way. In other words, they would not be back to your forefathers, everybody's forefathers, conception, that is the major domo parts of life's body of believing that there are two great armed camps or two great camps of good and evil. The good gods and the bad gods, the good forces and the bad forces. To understand anything, no matter what your terminology would have been, no matter what the maps would have been, you think, as it were, from three different directions. You are conscious, as it were, of any situation having three parts to it of any so-called problem, any question has got three pillars, three legs supporting it. Right beyond what I am referring to as individual situations, problems, questions, is you have got more of a, dare I say, cosmic situation as everything being run from a primal flow into a division of labor. The C, D, and E I have casually referred to, not incorrectly, from the binary perception that the kinds of C forces would be that that apparently were constructive, whether you had a majority view or not, whether you were wired up to have the prevailing attitude or not. 
but whoever you were, however you were wired up, your perception is in any given situation, any given time of day, that certain things going on you find favor with, your own inner voices might say that it's beyond your personal inclination that you are correctly perceiving that here is an objective way in which life or humanity is moving in a profitable, constructive manner, whereas what I'm referring to as the would be that which your voices, your own hardwired consciousness would apparently be disapproving of, that this is not in the best interest of humanity, this is not in the best interest of decent people, this is not in the best interest of civilized society, etc. E being the eternal problem, that no one with a binary attitude, no one with hardwired, ordinary nervous system brains can conceive of there being an E. Whereas, when I pointed out to you in passing times, for a split second, you can get it. It just doesn't make any sense. Because I can do it the easy way and say, all right, E is the irrelevant. But now let's try a slightly different approach. Slightly different. Maybe this will drag some of you somewhere else. Uh, at one time, I even pointed out to you, using that great old Yin Yang. And you might note throughout history, throughout history, whether it be called philosophy, religion, weird ideas, all of these people, whether they're dressed up like the Pope, the head rabbi, the head rabbit, a wizard, a magician, no matter what seems to be the props, no matter who seemed to be the stage director, if they're good, they're good at one thing above all, and that is what? And the crowd said, being able to divide everything into two. They are amazing at that. I have heard, and I could have guessed, some people, if they were pushed to describe it, would look upon ordinary rannings of would-be mystics, of would-be ministers, those apparently doing the work of the gods, people preaching from a holy book. What is it they're good at? And the wonder that some people would express about how does that guy get there? He has got to be in touch with the gods. I'm not even a blank, what a religion is. I don't believe in their teachings, but look at that son of a bitch. He comes out there night after night, travels the world, waves that Bible, picks out passages that don't even make sense to me. Going through two or three translations, all this archaic things about Joseph begot so and so, and all this old English, which you know, it's hard to remember how it is that Jews 3,000 years ago spoke like Chaucer. <laughs> Who am I to say? But how this man can pace a stage night after night and just seem to be touched with some kind of his, some of the fundamentalists call it, you know, a, a holy spirit. I have been anointed by the gods, and it, it's not me here. I don't heal people. I don't give these great messages. The gods speak through me. And people that are not even connected with the religion can, at least in Soto voice off stage, say, wow, I don't believe all that crap, but how does that guy do it? What is it he is doing that is impressive, if you find it impressive. And it's more impressive than perhaps your local 17-year-old rock band or your local out-of-work shade tree mechanic trying to sing like Merle Haggard. It might be more impressive than hear your crazy Uncle George tell jokes at Christmas when he's half shot. But what is it that the guy is really doing? What he is really doing, what he excels at, is being able to divide everything into two. If you can do that and you have a glib tongue at all, you got it, just according to which book you want to wave, assuming that you are wired up and you're in the right position and life can use another minister. It's then whether you're going to wave the Old Testament, New Testament, the Koran, Buddha's writings, etc. All of you should have some feel for how wonderful it would be if everything were divided into two. How easy it would be for whatever you thought your original goal coming here was. 
you know, that you want to have a mystical experience, you want to be blown away and join Buddha and Navara, you want to be more awake, as the Sufis would say, or you want to be awake rather than walking around in this state of sleep. You want to be reborn, as the Christians would say. But what does it all amount to? What it amounts to is a belief like everyone else. And it's more than a belief, let me expand that. You are wired up to find that the basis of it is going to be two armed camps. That wherever you are now is where you don't want to be. And so the answer is in the other place. If the reality of this, if the next stage of reality to human life where you can understand something, if it were no more than these kind of yin yangs, it was no more than God versus Satan, no more than an upright life as opposed to a down left life, wouldn't you all be happy? Hell, I would surely be world famous if that was the point. Because I could divide things up faster than these ordinary preachers could even run the multiplication cables if they could understand that. There is a great attraction. It is wired into everyone to hear things, if not in a glib manner, if not in a literate manner, then above all, in a passionate manner, that everything is divided up into two. It all fits, damn it, it all fits. It's always fit. All the way from the early Far Eastern ideas of a yin-yang, of a masculine and a feminine persuasion of the higher powers and the lower powers. And that all of this is a struggle that everyone who is attempting to pursue some sort of path, everyone who is seeking for some answer beyond the material world, it's got to be simple. They are in the less desirable place, and they've got to move to the more desirable place. I was going to try and drag your attention slightly askew from prior attempts having to do with E, because to be able to divide things up into two, to believe that you clearly can see C and D. I will again, rhetorically, if not foolishly assume, when I point out that all of you realize that that does not get you anywhere. You had all these decades before you got involved with this, and you still got all the time. That gets you nowhere. Not just a theoretical cul-de-sac, not just that it cannot be explained why evil exists if a god, if some force outside the system created it and gave it free will, and etc put it under some kind of direct physical laws and then made people believe that they're not bound by these almost, or by these rather astringent, to be charitable about it, laws. That it's got to be divided up into either this and that. What cannot be seen, what cannot be held in ordinary consciousness is, to use one example again, this would seem rather clear cut that you got two pieces there. I could say that you don't have two pieces. I could say that you've got to have the circle out here as a third part, or these two don't make sense. Then somebody could say, well, wait, you don't really need a circle because each one is making part of the circle. All right, fuck you then, if that's what you're going to say. <laughs> Then I'm going to have to say this to you. Even if my first one that I used to use and nobody ever did come up and... But if you're going to say, all right, each of the halves, if this is C and that's D, or that's yin and that's yang, you don't need a circle because they themselves, when put together into this complete harmonic cosmic whole, they create their own unity. Ha ha, there is no third part. <laughs> Go draw me a yin yang on nothing. <laughs> 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 
that was not just humor. If we take, just for the time being, I'm not dwelling on this yin-yang symbol for some secret message. I'm just picking out one that I assume a lot of you know instead of using God and Satan and all that. If this indeed represents C and D, the two forces that everyone is wired up to feel as though support everything, whether it be in a religious context or otherwise, there has to be something to put it on. Now this is what consciousness cannot continually perceive. That is, if this is just the beginning, this is not necessarily the end of it by any means, any more than me saying the triaxial universe is the only universe that's going to give any of you correctly attracted to this any satisfaction in your life. But notice I periodically throw in uh, that that's not necessarily the limits of it. But you've got to be able to perceive that. You've got to be able to live in such a world. You can start off if indeed there was some place to start off, trying to perceive E as being the background. That if indeed, let's just start where ordinary consciousness is now in everyone, that wait a minute, I can see two forces, whatever the hell you want to call them. I see it, I'm not tied up in Eastern symbolism or mysticism, I'm not tied up in religion, but yes indeedy. Yes, indeedy, I can see that the world, in just any area that really holds my attention, is as though it were divided up into two armed camps, and there's this continual conflict. One day one camp seems to win, one day the next camp, etc. Some days I seem to be in favor of one side winning, then the next day I seem to have fallen over into the enemy's hands. None of that can be drawn, none of that can be depicted, none of that can be written about, none of that can be thought about. But let's start off in good old material terms. It cannot be drawn unless there is a background. Nobody in the world would have ever seen this two-dimensional symbol unless there was a background to draw it on, whether it be a piece of paper to draw it in the dirt, to take charcoal and draw it on somebody's hand and show it to somebody else. You would know no symbol in the world, be it this, be it the cross, the Star of David, Nothing. All of them, by the way, seeming to represent what? The Star of David is below, is ab above the cross, you know, suffering here in this life, and then a chance to escape suffering, and somebody else took care of it for you. All of them point to a two dimensional secret. But nobody would have ever seen, had any notion about a cross, a star of David, yin yang, unless there was something to draw it on. Now just face it. That's not mystical and there's no way out. You would have never suddenly conjured up in your head the star of David and then taken it into some kind of fantastic realms about what it represents. So these two triangles inverted in one another. And oh, all the possibilities. And all the little corners sticking out amount to six. And six has got to be a mystical number because if you multiply the base of the Great Pyramid by six and then you count the number of wires in the Brooklyn Bridge and multiply it by 600 and put that with the base of the uh, pyramid and then you take the number of husbands that, Greta Gar uh, that Zaza Gabor had and you put them all together anyway and then you come out, it'll come out to be a figure that has more sixes in it than anything else. So there you are. As important as all that may obviously be, simply face this simple fact. You would have never had any notion of the Star of David, the cross, yin-yang, unless you had seen it, unless there was something upon which someone drew it so that the light waves could bounce, get into your little rods and cones, and go into your little brain and make molecules move around, and then somebody perhaps describe it, or you just saw it and you're left with it, and then you figured out all these great cosmic possibilities, but it had to be drawn on something. There had to be a background or you would have never seen it. Never. This can be a deceptively simple way to start. Is that E to anybody, 
to anyone's present perception at any place, E is the ever-present background upon which this damn two-dimensional contact cartoon is drawn. If you could hold simply that awareness, that would interfere enough with the routine of binary consciousness so that things would have the possibility of slipping in. If you could just hold that awareness that whatever I'm seeing, I still see a conflict between my mother and me. I still see a conflict over here between the Protestants and the Catholics that's in Northern Ireland that has got to be settled. It's going to spread. Plus, if it doesn't spread physically, it's going to spread spiritually. It's going to taint generations of people that should be following the teachings of the great church, part of it. You cannot see that none of this exists in a vacuum. None of this exists without a background upon which it is portrayed. I'm going to make a quick assumption. I guess I can say enough about it. Is everyone familiar that for years Hollywood was putting out cartoons? Warner Brothers, Disney, that I don't, I can't recall the numbers now, but those kind of first class cartoons that used to come out in the 40s and 50s and maybe now had X amount of drawings per minute. And then when television got here, so the story goes, it took so long to produce one of these cartoons with the background and all, is in later times, I guess starting in the 60s, they came up with, I don't know what term they used, but the backgrounds became almost static. And they were able to cut down not only expenses, but supposedly their first problem was them trying to put out kids' cartoons every Saturday, a new one, that nobody could come up with enough people. It was not f either physically possible or phys fiscally <laughs> profitable. And so then, I assume, surely all of you are following what I'm saying, then they fell in, which was no great discovery, they would draw a background, if it was uh, like downtown city, in these buildings, and then the character is running along, and then the anti-character chasing him. And if you give a little glimpse, you realize there's about three buildings here that fill up your TV screen. That is, fill up one frame there. And all they do is they leave it. They keep repeating it. And they do have to draw the character's feet moving a little bit. But nobody has to go and continually draw a new background. Now, surely all of you know this. So that, whatever it was, that when cartoons were in their heyday, when money seemed to be no problem, that they did it right to a T, that they were just playing with reality. If it took X amount of frames, X amount of drawings to fill up a minute, then what they did in TV, you know, became X over 10. It was a great savings, but the background just became very childish. And people got accustomed to it, it was no big deal. But the backgrounds, <laughs> the effort spent, let us say, is one-tenth what a Disney, one of those Fantasia, one of his all-out bombastic cartoons would do to where there was as much work done on each little frame, including the background. You knew I wasn't going to talk about cartoons, I guess. How about, isn't it delightful as always, since I went to the trouble to figure all this out, <laughs> that as always, heavens be praised now that I think about it, I could find a parallel between that and trying to do this. <laughs> Wait a minute, now that I think about it. Now surely, all of you have got this in mind by now. Think back. I know some of you people are 18, 19, maybe 25 years old. You don't fool me. I know that some of you on Saturday morning turn on these cartoons. <laughs> Bullwinkle, some of that. The backgrounds, they spend almost no time. And they spend just a modicum of time of making the, the characters themselves move. Just their jaw perhaps move, but they save all kinds of time and effort with the background. <laughs> the background becomes, it's crude. Let's put it that way. That's not a 
limited to my artistic critique, but they are simply crude. It's just a very roughshod drawn background to give some impression of what, where they are, whether in the mountains, by a river, in a downtown urban area. And then if the characters move, they execute very little change in the background. They'll keep running the same mountain, one, two, three little humps there, over and over. The guy can run evidently for 10 miles and it's those same three down mountains. They're running down the street in a city, it's those th same three buildings over and over and over. What I was going to say was a marvel now that I started talking about it. Now that I think about it, no one finds that to be, if you can still try and hold in mind what I started out of talking about this elusive E, the third leg that must be present for anything to be perceivable, for you to, of which you could be conscious in any manner, taking E as a background, what happens by the time you reach, let us say, that golden age of 21? I can call it bored, I can try to be fancy and call it ennui, <laughs> but who does not by now in your general life I'm not trying to put a curse on you. If it's otherwise, the fates be with you. But in general, how many people by the time you reach the golden age of 21, and I, now I point it out, the background is almost down to this real crude Saturday morning, churn them out, two or three people, and evidently no great demand on their talent if they have any, to draw these kind of backgrounds. Put, I put to you, at the ordinary level of consciousness, does that sound that far removed from the cartoon lies that everyone leads? Were it not for what appears to be the binary, the contact sport, the interaction between you and some other character, between a sexual mate, an employer, a family, if it weren't for that modicum of action, that little bit of just your jaws moving a little bit, <laughs> You know, the Fred Flintstone cartoons. <laughs> the figures just stand there and their chins move a little bit to show that they're talking. The background is nothing. And they move a little bit, just the feet move. Then the chin moves a little more and the background is really the same as it was. They walk through their house and surprising from room to room, they're all the same. Nobody feels any affinity to that. <laughs> that if you were dependent upon the background if you had some kind of continuing awareness of what I'm saying, that you could look upon the E as being the background, and you tried to turn and look at the background upon which you were living out this cartoon life, I'm sorry, this life, <laughs> that if you were left with the background, would that not perhaps give, I ask you now, think about it right quick, would that not even give you a whole new, perhaps sorry, perhaps frightening definition of what boring is, what crude is, that if this is exemplary, of course, I'm not referring to this, but if the background upon which I live, my background, let's say I'm C, more or less, day by day, I'm C, doing my best to be C, got all these D forces, and so take it based on what you just saying, then everything else, the background upon which my drama, the conflict between me and everybody else, all other problems, then the background would be E. All right, if I looked at the E, if I took me and the other central characters away from my cartoon and I used thee as being exemplary to my life, would that not perhaps give a whole new definition <laughs> of crude and boring? Could anybody even bear it? Would it make any sense whatsoever if you could stop? Do you follow me? If you could pluck at any given time, you and whoever else is involved in your dramas. I say most people's, at least one area of their, one prime area of their drama is going to be between them and their mate. If you're sexually continually involved with somebody, living with somebody, I don't mean you have to have fist fights all the time, but there is a continuing drama, a give and take, push pull. Were it not for that, many people would feel almost no excitement not even speaking of the sex involved, but just the rest of it, or what do we do? What do we have for supper tonight? Where do you want to go tonight? Not that movie again, let's go here. Let us say, you should be able to feel that many people, that that is just the minimal spark that seems to make life get by day by day. 
So what if at any given time you could pluck you and the other central character out of this cartoon? Those in the forefront, the characters, and you're left of the background. And you tried to make some sense that this in some way is indicative of my life. Or in some way I could look at this, or someone else could, an archaeologist, a cosmic archaeologist, a psychological archaeologist could look at this background and get some notion of what I was, what I'm up to. Or if they could, would I not be humiliated? Assuming they could, but what if they couldn't? Can you, if I just looked at the background, could it be drawn any cruder? I seem to move. I travel 50 miles a day. I travel thousands of miles in my mind. <laughs> but this background, are you going to tell me that the ordinary level, you turn out your background and it's much different than these crudest of Saturday morning cartoons wherein somebody runs across the whole city being chased? And if you look good, there are three little outlines of buildings from block to block that repeat themselves and the guy has run, who knows, 20 blocks, 50 blocks. And that's the background upon which he is operating. Are you going to tell me that that does not strike any note of familiarity with anyone? Again, not to give you the blues, but you're going to have to face facts, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> now, man being above all things, for a one word description again, being a converter, that we are all converting energy. We are all converting energy within the growing, expanding body of life. Can you see? that I could express in words and you can live it in deeds, the need and the possibility of being able to take that which apparently is the background and convert it into the normally two-dimensional equation of C and D to everyone else. equaling everything, and at best, now I'm telling you, if nothing else, E would be the background upon which I drew this equation. The background of C and D in this great eternal ever-changing conflict, but if you could take what apparently is the background and convert it, you personally, and we're not talking about some mistake on last part, and we're not talking about something that is possible for large numbers of people. It's only possible for Pogita numbers of people. Very few people. But to be able to take that, once you even got some continuing notion that there is a background upon which I am playing out this cartoon drama, to be able to take that which is E, that which is background, and convert it into the normally bidimensional equation of C and D, is to convert E somewhere into C plus D. That did not come out vocally as simple as I intended it. Yeah, it did. <laughs> what I can feel some of you waiting was for me to put it even more direct to say to convert E into C or D, and that is what I was refusing to say. To be able to convert the background pieces of the background, some part of the background to convert it into some part of this. But I'm not going to say as simple as turning E into C, because if you did that, then what? Come on. C would then be the new E. But it's to be able to pluck that, to take it, whether it be an actual deed or whether it be in perception, whether it be on your own, based on your own understanding, that here you are in a CD conflict the great historical conflict, and you're right at home. You're there with all the historical heroes. You're there with Anthony and Cleopatra. You're there with Romeo and Juliet. You're there with 
Ernest and Julio. <laughs> You're there in the midst of the good guys versus the bad guys. In every war, every conflict, But there is a background against which all of this is played. It is always there. One more time I refer you, if you've got to have some picturization, and it's not unfair to start, is that none of this would exist unless there was a background upon which to depict it, all the way from a drawing of a so-called religious symbol to written information, the vast majority of everything that men know, I assume everybody can see this, if you can see, comes from here. The vast majority of what is called knowledge is not just the experience of what happened, if in fact we, for the time being, for a split second, if I gave any credence to the idea that we do eat our experiences and an ordinary man is continually being changed by what he experiences, which he is not, but if that were true, you are still talking about there had to be a background upon which you felt, upon which you heard, upon which you apparently had some experience that in fact enveloped you that you could not just limit to eyesight or touch or sound, that there were complete experiences I have undergone, things that happened to me, but they did not happen without a background. And what you have for ordinary existence is a crude Saturday morning cartoon mill where you can move you around this planet, move you from Podunk, Missouri to Paris, France, move you from there to Bombay, India, to Melbourne, Australia. But if you had the sight you would realize, many of you have been through this, that there you are, you're in Gay Paris, you're in Australia with a pith helmet, you're in Bombay with a pistol, and you look around, it's the same background. You're trying to pick up now a dark-skinned woman with long black hair, then later you're trying to pick up some woman in a bar in Australia trying to understand trying to conceive of the fact that they actually believe they're speaking English. And it seems like, well, this is all different. I'm wearing shorts over here. I'm wearing lederhosen over here. I got on a beret when I was back there. And you look around, and the background is those same three buildings that the little terrified mouse is running across. It's the same three little humps. They're supposed to represent mountains that Bullwinkle is flying across. The background has not changed. A very crude, minimalistic, repetitious background. You are not living a complex, colorful story such as, to make a comparison again, Walt Disney's Fantasia, or even in the heydays back with Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, to where there was real artwork, real effort and time and money spent just on the background. That is not an ordinary existence. An ordinary existence is a slapdash, crude, repetitious background. It is not when you can take pieces of the background, when you can convert in your own way, for your own purposes, that you can convert pieces of this apparently irrelevant. At first blush, this visually repetitious, crude background, and you drag it into what apparently is the main characters in their conflict, that is you, of course, always in the midst of it, and then the other partner, the other character. You ordinarily being C, other people being D, and you can take a piece of E, and you bring it into the foreground. When you do that, the so-called mystical states become irrelevant. When you can do that, the idea of being converted into something else becomes irrelevant. I assume all of you remember from the last few weeks when I was mentioning the C and D and E forces, persuasions, possibilities, and I was mentioning 
a kind, or I suggested to you at that time, hint, 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 the possibility of an ongoing royal collusion. If you looked upon C and D as being these princes, their own domains and the whole world, the universe perhaps, but at least man's world was divided up into two principalities and they were run by these princes C and D that on the surface were in continual conflict with one another. C and D had gone through a never ending struggle, always either overt warfare or preparing for war. And then I suggested you the possibility that C and D, these princes were in collusion, that they had learned that the most beneficial way to keep humanity growing, to make people struggle to invent things, to work, to save, to toil, to come up with new theories, to live a more productive life, is you had to keep some kind of pressure on them. And rather than each prince, that's just one possibility, rather than each prince having to be a tyrant to his own people and put on that kind of pressure and say that everybody who does not work 10 hours a day gets beaten for two hours every night. And out of every 10,000 people, if somebody doesn't invent some new profitable machine once a year, then we're going to shoot uh, every other person whose name is Fred. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, we're going to take all the women and hide them for six months. <laughs> you know, other than each prince had to apply that kind of pressure. Why not me appear to be the good guy to my principality said Prince C, he told Prince D, I'll always say, and you always be over there, right across the border, rattling sables. I always say, hey, if we don't work, if we don't produce, they're going to come over here and overtake us, and we know what a bunch of infidels and Philistines they are. No taste, no character. They make a tiller. You know, look like Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> And Prince D does the same thing. That was my suggestion to you. While reminding any of you newer people that this has nothing whatsoever to do with politics as you know it, as religion as you know it, it has really nothing to do with anything as you know it. <laughs> except, except I just can't go that far and tell you that, or then some of you would begin to get curious. <laughs> so I can't tell you that. But in this royal collusion that I so strongly hinted to you, <laughs> let me go back and use everyday horizontal affairs in life, inside the body of life as it comes out, not just in individual human behavior, but on larger areas. As always, it's a matter that life is talking to itself Life is talking through man, but as long as you can only hear with two ears, even when you listen to yourself, even when you listen to whoever seems to be the most learned person in your field of interest, you never hear what life is actually saying. You're always left in this binary conflict or this binary situation that somebody is saying something, the sound waves come and they hit my ear, so we got the great contact sport. Yes, I heard you. But if we're going to say what is possible to be heard equals 100%, which is all you can say it makes any sense in this 2D world on a 3D background, then what you heard somebody say was 66 and two thirds percent. You missed 33 and a third percent of something that was said always, same way with sight, but right now let's talk about hearing. Life is talking. Not only literally, but figuratively. And when you're operating from this level of consciousness, which everyone is supposed to, which is all that's necessary for the vast majority of us human molecules and life's growing body, it is talking, but it is continually talking about such matters as apparent religious and political conflict. And they seem to have played a most significant part in human history, and they seem to still be of real importance that many of you at the ordinary level, many of you when you're away from me, away from these tapes, and you go back to your good senses, 
you still read the papers, you still worry about that you've got relatives in Ireland or Beirut or Palestine or wherever the hot spot happens to be whenever you see these tapes months or years from now. And you look upon what seems to be political conflicts and to many people, religious conflicts seem even worse. Jews fighting Christians, Protestants fighting Catholics, Muslims fighting Jews, Muslims fighting Christians, Muslims fighting Muslims, and things are wired up so that those at the present cutting edge of a time zone, that is, the planet's most mechanically sophisticated, educated people, it's life's nervous system up at its own line level consciousness, which will assume all of you meet that criteria somewhere. <laughs> no, we, well, I do assume that. I wouldn't talk to you in such a, how do you pronounce erudite? Erudite manner. <laughs> it seems to be most questionable, if not distasteful, and if not despicable, that there's still people on this planet killing one another over religion. And in off times, such as Northern Ireland right now, here in the 1980s, and it's been so for decades now, they were then the same general religion, just to use one example, Christianity, where we've got the parts of that schism of it being the Protestants versus the Catholics. But they're all supposedly worshiping the same God. They believe they had the same prophet, Jesus. They use the same book. And those people are teaching their children to get down behind fences and to shoot somebody across the street simply because they claim they're a Catholic instead of a Protestant. And this strikes people as being, as I said, all the way from just staggering in its insanity, all the way from that to just more proof that we're living in some disgraceful state of sin or stupidity that people could kill one another, much less argue, that's bad enough, argue over something as basic, as wonderful, as important as religious notions. And so you missed it. What's going on is a struggle for power. It's got nothing to do with two-dimensional religion. Even when it gets into areas that you might think would be more acceptable as a background for a struggle and conflict, the world of politics. Still, most contemporaneously sophisticated, educated people still are wired up at line level consciousness to find that very disagreeable, if not verging on the insane again. At the time I'm saying this, in the 1980s, we're still confronted with the great conflict between the USSR and the USA. According to which side you're on, that seems to represent C and D. But as always, there are voices within last body that are saying, wait a minute, this is insane. Of course, the story is now, it's just a variation up from Pope Gregory and the crossbow, but now the story is, look, both countries, both of these great powers have got these atomic, these nuclear weapons, and so it's past the point of us arguing because one of us don't like the lifestyle, the political style of the other one. It's too dangerous, we're gonna kill each other. So people are out trying to stop, laying down on railroad tracks, trying to stop the shipment of atomic weapons. Uh, people are defecting from one country to the other, people are holding peace marches and saying, this is insane. We got to be able to live in peace and quiet together here on this little lonely planet. And it's insane for us to be involved in one of us say we're a democracy or a republic or going by the name of democracy and here's this socialistic state calling itself followers of Lenin and Marx and all this and people say look I've read all that in college I am not an uneducated man I'm telling you that's insane how can you argue over a political theory how can you order order argue over a theory of any kind and you missed it that is the consumption for children that no matter you might have majored in political science you may have been trying to second guess or pick flaws in my real quick history right there between conflicts and religion, or right now conflicts between the East and the West politically. But you missed it. 
as far as understanding anything, you wasted all the time in under and over graduate school because life was talking already. Well, I'm sure you enjoyed it anyway. Women and booze and... There is no such thing as a struggle over politics. There is no such thing as a conflict over religious ideas. There is a struggle in the body of life itself for power. And by power, I gave you a couple of minutes for people's mind to go ahead and jump ahead of that. By power, I don't mean what you think of as power. I don't mean what political commentaries talk about power. I don't mean about one country dominating another. That's nothing. Or one the Protestants finally running all the Catholics out of Northern Ireland or vice versa, or the Jews running all the Arabs out of the Middle East. That means nothing. That's not what power. Power is a transfer of energy. It is a transfer of heat. It is the focal point in life's body. We're still talking about localized conditions and separating reality into segments that we can talk about. That the conversion unit that at one time could have been Nation X that now the conversion has switched to nation Y. All the killings, all the saber rattlings, all the blood flowing in the streets, you're dealing with 66 and two thirds of it at best to believe. The voices in you that say, what a shock, what a shame that these two religious groups can't get together and everybody worship the same kind of God and all hold hands and run through this and skip together and you know, stick daisies down in the rifles of the National Guard, that that would be heaven. When are we going to grow up? You don't understand anything. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got nothing to do with politics. It's got everything in the world to do with power. It's parts of life's body seeking new heat. It is parts of life's body even attempting and oftentimes succeeding. It's very hard to see it. It's hard to see it even historically over a thousand years if you're looking with two eyes, that the locale of a certain kind of heat, a certain kind of energy conversion moved from one part of the last body to another. And it goes by the name of conflict. It comes out historically as a detailing, apparently, of the success of one society over another, of the success of one religion trampling another one but you don't know how far you are from it, and you don't know what you're missing. You don't know how much time you're spending in the hardwired contact sport with life of having your own system respond to this in some apparently meaningful way. When you're responding to that, it was meant for children. You're responding to that at the lowest common denominator within the cells of life's body itself. Right, quick, let me point out. As always, this is a matter of degree insofar as the information that life lets out. Just listen right quick. Some of this, I was about to say, won't take but a second, may push some of you into a proper place to see it. This is not much of a footnote, and it's certainly not any sort of proof that I'm offering or evidence to what I said. But life knows this on a simpler level beyond the fact of me saying that no one understands it, there are people that have some knowledge of it. Those that are hardwired to be diplomats, those that are hardwired throughout the ages, I don't mean just now, between the USSR and the USA, but always between the princes, C and D. They have ministers. They have people taking messages back and forth. And those people that are close to what appears to be the seats of power, whether it be political or religion, they don't understand it. But I'm just showing you that life, this information is always out there to varying degrees, and it begins to spread in certain ways. Those actually involved, and I don't mean anybody in specific, I'm not trying to give any of you people any kind of insane hints that there are people in politics or the Catholic Church or the Jewish religion that understand any of this. But there are people always always the ministers who print C and D that do have a kind of knowledge amongst themselves. It's just they have it. That the princes have never sat down and told them that this is all a sham. But I'll put it to a behavioral side. They could not operate as being go-betweens as ministers 
unless they had a kind of knowledge, not an understanding, but a knowledge that, hey, the prince, when he is attacking, when, when my prince is attacking the religion of these other people, and even his religious leaders are attacking their religious leaders, you know, that's bullshit. This whole thing's about power. This whole thing is who's going to take over the other country? Is C going to take over D? Is my prince going to? Are we going to be defeated? That is, those that are drawn in, they're wired up to be a part closer to this apparent seats of the center of these conflicts. They know it with no, not any understanding. It's just a fact. They got no reason to talk about it, but they know that by and large, I assume that they have diplomatic euphemisms, but they understand that this is bullshit. My people, the prince I serve, is not attacking these other people because of their religious beliefs, because they're worshiping a short, squat, green statue, and we got a tall, thin statue that's red. That don't have shit to do with it. This thing is a battle for power. Or this idea that our, our political system is superior to theirs, it's better for people, that the gods ordained it, and theirs came right from the roots of demonic pits is the pits. You can scrap all that. They know that without any understanding. That it is all a matter of power to them. It's who is going to win this. And everything else is just bullshit. Everything else is they got to say something. Like I have to say something in this day and time. The press is going to catch me every time I go over here to make a trip. They catch me and I've got to say something, even if it's no comment, or we're making some progress. Or we should not let our differences annihilate us because at least we're reasonable enough men that we can get together and agree that we do have our differences and we can work on our common interest. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That's all I have to say. But there are people that close. There have always been wired up to be ministers the same way that some people are wired up to be the princes that they understand that all this talk about religious conflict, political conflict, is absolute bullshit. It's for the press. It's for the peons. It's for the masses, because you got to say something. But they know what it is. They know that my prince is the biggest infidel in the world. They know that my prince is the biggest tyrant in the world. He doesn't give a rat's ass for people's rights, for democracy, for making the world safe. What he wants to do is be in control. Remember, I told you this has nothing of any consequence to do with politics or religion. We're talking about you. Within life's body and then within your body, you can find the struggle between my apparent princes of two kingdoms that I suggest to you are not in as much a direct opposition as they are in a secret collusion. But this collusion does not stop the fact that for life and for you to stay alive, they are both, even if they're in collusion, it's what you've got to understand, which bypasses, it short circuits, all lateral reason. They're not only in collusion, but they are both seeking power and it has to be at the expense of the other one. It is not total annihilation of the other one, even if they were foolish enough, which they're not, to believe it, that it's possible, because it's not. So if they did believe, if C or D did believe, that I can totally overtake, that I can get power, it can be a zero game. I'm going to get 100% of the power, and the other principality is going to get zero power. That's my kind of game. If they were foolish enough, which they're not, to believe that, it's still impossible. So they're living somewhere this side of Disneyland. But it's, they don't believe that, because they don't believe anything the way in which you do. There is not a question of total annihilation. C is not going to overtake D or vice versa completely. But remember, and this bypasses all lateral so-called understanding. I mean, if you're tied up in lateral mindedness, it's just insanity. I suggest to you the great possibility that they are in continual, direct collusion. And yet they are both seeking power 
and the only power immediately available is at the expense of the other one with whom they are in this collusion, maybe. If you were past lateral mindedness, I wouldn't have to point out the obvious at times to say, well, that's insane, that you can't have it both ways. Once you see such as that, it is more fun than laughing at somebody's armpit or their feet. It's more fun than, that's more fun than just almost anything. And you realize what, if this helps, it's like almost priceless fun. This is no good comparison, but since I'm going to talk for another few minutes and get our money's worth out of these tapes, <laughs> I, have to, I, have to, I have to make up some. It is like a J. Paul Getty or somebody having all the world's great paintings, or many of them, in this big old house, and he won't let anybody in. And he realizes, he knows that there are people all over the world that would love to see these Picassos that nobody even knows Picasso painted except Picasso and me. I got them right from him, brought them here, and I don't let anybody in here. And the man can stand there you know, and smile and slobber and jump up and down and say, only me. <laughs> so this is real poor. But I was trying to think of some way to tell you that when you see this, such things as possibility of them being in direct, continual collusion with one another, and nobody knows it but them two, for sure. That when you see this, such things as possibility of them being in direct, continual collusion with one another, and nobody knows it but them two, for sure, and yet they both nonstop that the collusion is not simple, binary, illusionary conflict. They are both, per force of being there, per force of being the princes, they are in a continual struggle for more power, and the way to get more power is at, and only at, at the binary level, the expense of the person with whom, I suggest, they may be in direct continual collusion. Both of those can't be true, it's just, I mean, there's nothing to do with that if you're lateral-minded, other than wonder who would have ever thought to invent telescopes for fish. <laughs> and yet when you see it, it's a kind of almost solitary glee, but it's also another piece of your understanding that at the ordinary level, neither I nor anyone else can correctly perceive anything. Because at the ordinary level, it's all got to make sense. <laughs> but at the ordinary level, the only thing that makes sense is that which is lateral. <laughs> it is one electron. It is one blood cell being stuck down there in a capillary, and only one gets through at a time, and I can't tell which one's going through next. But if you did see it, it's the same ones going through all the time. You can't hardly tell one from another. Oh, you can look and say, well, wait a minute. This almost, I know what those little, cap those little blood cells mean. That's supposed to be mountains. <laughs> and they keep repeating one after the other. Oh, when the guy runs through, the little scared mouse runs through town, that's supposed to be buildings in the background. And it's one down building after another, the same ones. It's one down mountain after another. It is one blood cell after another, forced, one at a time. That makes sense. 
that, say all the world's great thinkers, that, by God, by God, makes sense. That I can follow. On the basis of that, we'll finally explain everything. Right. It is at a right angle to the force flow of lateral thinking, to the force flow of one electron being squeezed after another, of one crudely drawn mountain, one shipshodly sketched building in the background, that that which seems to be the background upon which you are living, the background upon which everyone lives at the ordinary level on Saturday morning, If it doesn't make sense, I can't do anything with it. But then what people are kept from realizing, because it's still part of the same game, is that no one realizes that in a quite real sense, nobody understands any more today than they did 5,000 years ago. That's not literally true. But it's true enough that unless you are exceptional already, you can't find the flaw in it. That for a long time, that seems to be true. And it just about is true since nothing is exactly true, but that's just about, <laughs> that just about is true. That people in general do not understand any more about what's going on than they did 5,000 years ago. But nobody notices that. We live a lot longer. We got colored TVs and hell, 5,000 years ago, it was all black and white. <laughs> we got digital tuners on our stereos and back then they were still using analog knobs. And, Things are a lot better. Women look better. They don't stink, and they shave their armpits in some places. We're all better off. We've got more books. I'm better educated. And of course, mainly, we live longer. We're healthier. We can buy better cars, which is all fine. I'm in favor of all of it. Nobody asked me. But if you're in favor of it, hell, I'm in favor of it. It's fine. But it is not noticed, and you don't need a degree in history. All you need is a way in which you learn to read your own DNA, and you realize our forefathers, and it's right there, the information is in you, it's in the nervous system, it's in your genes, it's taking the information, taking the development that all of my historic progenitors have left within my own genes taking up the line level consciousness, I understand what all of humanity has always understood. That's as much as I understood five years ago, two years ago, last week, until I got involved with this. But going back as far as I can genetically remember, which is as far as humanity was conscious in the way in which it is now, you can feel, there's no doubt about it, it's not a debate, it's not a science fiction scenario I'm dreaming up, that at line level consciousness, you and everybody else, for all intents and purposes, do not understand any more than they did 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, in some parts of the planet. <laughs> Except nobody realizes it. Nothing's wrong. If nobody realizes it, but now you should know that it ain't that important, is it? Or somebody would realize it. <laughs> it is a short turn from there to life having, in certain parts of its body, this belief that, wait a minute, uh, something is wrong. I don't think people do understand a whole lot, and I know why. Because what they're after, what's been bugging me, is I want some kind of drastic knowledge, and it's not readily available. It's the kind of thing that only the gods, only supernatural people outside this piss-poor cartoon system understand. Now you've got the great world of the occult. It is information outside my system. It's information that I have got to refer to as an external source, because it's certainly not in me. And by and large, I have this feeling that nobody understands things correctly. My parents, my religious leaders, and so it's some kind of big secret somewhere. And of course, those are routinely drawn to pursuing such a course. If they could see in a trilateral manner, and some of you have been through this, if not many of you, that that really got you nowhere either. It might have made you grow your hair, shave your hair, eat fruits, not eat fruits, but you didn't understand anymore. There 
is a struggle within life's body, a correct struggle, not a struggle between good and evil, but a struggle between that which is the most efficient way to grow, the most efficient way to convert energy for new growth, and ways that are less efficient, ways that have been outmolded, ways that have been proven less than efficient today. That is what makes different types of people on life's body on this planet. That is a part of the division into races, nationalities, of one group being up today, one group being down tomorrow, one part of the world being a tinderbox. This year, two centuries ago, this particular part of the world was of no consequence. You're talking about the history of man, the history of humanity. But then, within each person, but a, you've got a much shorter period of time, of course, instead of us talking about five or 7,000 years of yellow circuit history of humanity as a whole, we're talking about you having 30 or 40 years thus far. And then reference, once you can read it, but right now all you know about is you've got 30 years of experience to draw on. And 30 years of information of reading, suppose, about other people's experience. And so you don't feel it this strongly. And even if you live to be 75, you still won't feel it as strongly as many people perceive the great panorama of the history of all of humanity. But within your 70 years, your 75 years, Within you, on another level, is this same kind of struggle for power and supremacy of parts of you. Nobody looks at it that way. What do you call it if for whatever reason you decide, I am going to start running every morning? It'll be good for my cardiovascular system. I'll live longer. It'll make up for me being a chain smoker. I'll just do it. And you get up and there's a struggle for power. Let's say you don't get up, you wake up in the morning. <laughs> and there is immediately a struggle for power. One prince says, we're going to get up. I still have the dreams from last night. I'm going to run. I got dreams of me two months from now or maybe two days from now when I've lost 40 pounds. <laughs> and then you got another prince. You have literally, this is not a joke you've got. I'm just picking out a crude example to start with if I don't refine it. You have literally a struggle for power, a struggle for supremacy what is going on in the nervous system, in the brain itself, when it's divided up apparently in this yin and yang, when it's divided up into its ability to cut all ideas, all feelings, all emotions, all apparent desires and motivations into two counts. You have set up, you have no choice at the ordinary level, but you have set up this continual running conflict and it is a battle for supremacy. It is a continual seeking within you of one aspect of this apparent organism, you, the individual. It is a will to power. You can call it, if you don't like it, according to this partnership, there always seems to be you and this other voice, this other possibility of you, the basis of the notion of the unconscious mind, subconscious motivations, this partnership that is you and somebody else in you according to whose side you seem to be on at any given moment. Or whether you do jump out of bed and do go run, or whether you do manage to lay around and light a cigarette, doze back off to sleep until it's too late that you've got to go to work, and so you do it tomorrow. Somebody won. That's the way you look at it. According to where the position is in your partnership, where you seem to be conscious, whether it's you or this other part, you can look upon the battle that morning as being victorious or otherwise. In other words, you can get up and let's say that you decide, hey, I got carried away last night. I'm not getting up at no damn 5.30 every morning and go out there and run the possibility of turning my ankles, getting shin splints. I've seen all that crap. Uh, I'll find something else to do. Uh, that's just insane, especially at my age. I'm not going to lose that much weight. I'm not going to get attractive to 19-year-old girls again. Or you fall back to sleep, you get up just in time to take a quick shower and get to work what you've got to do and then feel guilty. All right, tomorrow I'll do it. I mean, I lost this morning. It's inertia. It's laziness. I've always been lazy. My father was lazy. They accused me of being lazy. I'll do better, damn it. I'll set the clock. Uh, I'll set it 30 minutes earlier. Uh, I'll, I'll get a, a pail of cold water there and I'll throw it in my face. I'll do something so you can feel like you lost. Of course, the other prince in you that wanted to sleep, he won. But for this morning, you may feel as though you're on the losing side. You may feel that within this battle, this morning, I'm Prince C. I wanted to get up and do right. I know I should go in. I just know it. I just know it. And I didn't do it. 
But it was the first warning. The battle is not over yet. I lost this morning. Prince D overcame me. Laziness. Now I'll get him tomorrow. But as I said, it's where consciousness seems to be within this partnership, within this, may I suggest again, this possible collusion, not just between some kind of enigmatic forces out here that I'm calling C and D, there is a collusion within you. And everyone takes it personally, though. What else do you call suffering in life? Why do people need psychiatrists? Why do people need marriage counselors? Why did you originally need this? Why does everybody want a friend to talk to? Why do you wish your aunt Bertha was still alive because she was the only person that would listen to your strange ideas and not laugh at you? Or don't you wish you could dig your mother or father back up out of the grave and tell them, hey, I didn't mean it? It's a battle. That's exactly the way it appears. But if it were a true battle, everyone would be exploded. You would all be novas. <laughs> you would be, if not novas, some of you that's really obtained to higher horizontal heights, I guess you would be the infamous black hole by now. But you're not. You're not. You're still here, if you're ordinary. You're still here, and you still feel as though I am. You would not have used these terms, but you feel as though I am the background, or I am the battleground for some kind of damn war going on. But it's not truly a war, I suggest to you. That these forces that seem to be using you as a battleground, some days you win, some days you seem to lose. I suggest to you again the distinct possibility that there is a collusion going on. Because if it was true war, something would happen. There would have been, at a cellular level at least, a Hiroshima within you. One side would have bombed the other one. You would have exploded by now. You would be as wiped out as Nagasaki was. You'd be a desert. One of the forces, finally, after all these years of experience, would have you down like this, the other force, and everybody would be on their last leg. That's not so. People say they are. People claim, you know, the prevailing wisdom right now seems to be that great bumper sticker that, hey, life's a bitch and then you die. <laughs> Postscript, give me a break. But those are the bumper stickers on their car. You drive past them, blow your horn, they got a beer, and they go, hey. <laughs> the point being, even those that seem to take religion the most serious, the popes, the great rabbis, the rebel-rousing Protestant ministers pounding, waving holy books, and saying most of the world is going to a pit of fire. The gods are going to kill you and torment you. They do that night after night, and they work up a sweat, and they dance, and they sing, and they smile, and they afterwards they can go up and shake their hand. They say, did you enjoy it? Or you tell them, boy, that was a great one. Really? Oh, hey, great. Come back tomorrow. I got one. I got another sermon out of you sometimes that's even more than that. I mean, you got the point about forever being in this great liquid lake of fire and being down there to the point that even Dante would go by and go, Jesus Christ, I had no idea it was that bad. That was the part I loved. They go, yeah, yeah, did you like that? You say, yeah, I never heard anybody describe. I could almost feel the heat running up my jockey shorts. They go, yeah, come back tomorrow. I still am trying to suggest to you that things are not quite as black and white, as simplistic as they seem. But if that's all you can see, which is all ordinary people can see, it seems to be all right other than this nagging with some people dissatisfaction that somebody is holding out some little tidbit, I mean, some little secret. I mean, I know for sure that surely Jesus, for one instance, or Buddha, but say Jesus, he left some kind of secret, and that's what the popes and the church are about. They keep hanging, there's some little secret that a few people know that if I knew it, everything would be fine. This conflict would be over. They don't know anything. The same kind of conflict's going on. But the point of the last few minutes was to try, since I was trying to drag your attention from the apparent external world of politics and religious strife, is internally. If indeed this kind of dissatisfaction, this kind of internal struggle that everyone feels, if it was truly serious, that it's you and whatever it was that you felt most comfortable calling, it's me 
at my best and in my carnal nature. It's me and then my uncivilized subconscious. It's me and my unconscious traumas of my past. Or if you're more mechanically religious at some other time, you won't, it's, it's my godly part, it's the spirit of godliness. And then, based upon the way that the gods created us, then it's my baser part. It's the evil spirits, and they're struggling for control of me. Somewhere in there, whatever you liked, if you're ordinary, is everyone would feel, everyone agrees there is a struggle. Let's go back to my C and D, my two princes. I'm suggesting to you and trying to make you see that if indeed it was a true struggle, the way it feels, between God and non-God, between God and Lucifer, if it was a serious battle, something would have changed by now. Don't you agree? Now, let me appeal, if I may, to your goddamn lateral reasoning, if nothing else. I can get down and play at the fly brain level. If these great things, you got God, and then the next biggest thing to God was Lucifer, or anti-God, Satan, the second most powerful thing going. I mean, to the point that he worries God. All right, for all these thousands of years, <laughs> don't you think something would have happened by now that the, the battle would seem to be a little more close to a conclusion, or at least somebody would have really kind of taken over? It seems to be stagnant. Oh, sure, you can pick out some period of time and say, all right, we had this great conflict, you know, we had some madman jump up, and a whole bunch of hundreds of thousands of people are killed at this point in history. And then 500 years later, it happened again. And it happened again. But still, just turn your gaze back over, if not horizontal recorded history. If you could look at the kind of history in your own DNA, it still seems to be about the same status. What I've described to you about my, my fictitious princes that were in royal collusion, about rattling sabers, and one of them plays out he's going to attack, he gets those two attack, he gets some of his people to encroach over the border to the other principality, and they fight a while, some people die. They're going to die anyway. He does send some people in there, and they get killed. And then they retreat. Another side comes in, they occupy part of his territory. A year, a week, 10 years, 10 weeks. Then they regroup, and they go over and they kill some more, and they go back over and they retake all their land, but they encroach over into the other prince. It goes on. Some days you get and run, some days you don't. But if you can look, the general status between God and Satan, between good and evil, between sanity and insanity, the territorial holdings, the exercise of power between the prince says of C and D kingdoms, over the long haul, the status seems almost static. That doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> that if God is all that great, if the powers of goodness is the two-dimensional mind conceives it, that there is goodness, and then everything that doesn't fit in here is non-goodness and should be done away with. Everybody that's to a Baptist, everybody that's not a Baptist is either going to have to die and be done away with, or they got to become us to where there's no longer just Baptists and then everybody else. If we're all Baptists, then we're all, we're going to make it. We're all then part of the good side. If there were gods, as your forefathers believed, some kind of external figure, some figure even resembling us on some other scale or vice versa, I don't guess I should be completely an egomaniac, even on your part. Let's say that we resemble him rather than the other way around. After all these thousands of years, if he was that great, wouldn't you think that he'd made some kind of inroads that the forces of evil would really be in serious retreat by now? They're worried. No sign of it. Does that make you curious? As I said, even at the lateral level, that what if there was a God and a Lucifer? There were actually people outside this system, and they were struggling over us, that we were the land. We were the body politic, the living room. The new room of expansions that the Germans are always hollering about, but let's not go into that. 
<laughs> that we're what they're fighting over. And it was just as simple as your forefathers believed. And you know, some people believe nowadays, but let's try not to think about that. It would not give even a lateral-minded, reasonably lateral-minded person some pause to think perhaps I am in the midst of a charade. Perhaps I am a part of a royal, unseen collusion that God and Lucifer, they're not mad at each other. They're not actually in a do or death fight. They get together periodically and sit down and have a big time. They have a few drinks, they talk, smoke cigars. They plot out what's, they plot out what's going to happen. And it's only us that believes that this thing is a do or die serious struggle going on. <laughs> It's to make everything grow. It's to keep us all healthy. It's for their interest primarily, which they're serving higher up in the echelons than we are, but it's indirectly for our interest. Not that there's any choice. That wouldn't make, nobody ever gets curious. You're not supposed to be curious. At the binary level, you can't even be curious. On a good night, it's all you can do to hear some of this. Just that you hear it almost and it goes to a place in your brain that you didn't even know it operated. You didn't know that little part of your brain. I never thought anything like that. There is a struggle for power, but I'm suggesting to you a collusion within yourself. If not, why has not your, your worser part taken over more? Notwithstanding, some people say, well, I am getting worse. I used to drink a six pack a night and now I drink two six packs. That ain't much. Not if you're ordinary. What the hell difference does it make? <laughs> or somebody can say, uh, used to, I didn't, I didn't believe in God. After I got to college, I became an atheist. But after I found out I had lung cancer, I moved up. I'm now an agnostic. I'm, you know, I'm getting better. You know, if, if the radiation treatment don't help, hell, I may become a Baptist next week. <laughs> the point is, you can feel. By now, you should. It's not pessimistic. But you should feel, by and large, that this apparent struggle, that is, if you're trying to do better against your worser side, your lesser side, discount whatever you think you've gotten from this, back at line level consciousness. You should see, I don't care whether you're 25, 35, 55, if you could look into your own genetic history just for the last 25, 55 years, it hadn't changed that much. Now, I'm being charitable to say it hadn't changed that much. You've read books that supposedly told you how to do better and to how to more efficiently attack your bad habits, your vices, your more uncharitable, your less humane inclinations. You've attended clinics. You've undergone analysis. You've listened to different diverse gurus and spiritual teachers. But the truth is simply this. As far back as you can remember what seemed to be the status, back let's say in your teen years, that you were first aware that really something's going on here. It's not just parents and peers trying to get me involved with doing better or doing this. Inside, there is some kind of volcano, there's some kind of potential conflict within me. Ordinary people, as you know by now, tend to want to blame it on the, quote, environment. It was there. You're born with this partnership. You were born was it two principalities. But if you could feel in a certain way, it's no great mystical. Well, it is the first time you see it, I guess, but I'm putting in plain words for you. It is almost a blinding experience just for a second to realize, but no pessimism, because if it's pessimism, if you've got any particular feeling about it, all you are is back in the hands of one of the princes. But to realize this conflict, the nature of it, the balance of power, it's the same as it was when I was 14, 13, 12. I have not moved. I feel at times, I, well, at the time that I had to go and join AA, the time that I, they locked me up in the sanitarium for six months to try and dry me out, and that was a low point. The D guys, the bad guys were winning. Now I bounced back, and I went two years, and I didn't drink, and I went back home to my second wife, and I kept my children up, but then, the little business I started all fell apart. My partner stole all the money, and I went back to drinking. So there's the appearance 
of the conflict, the struggle, that Prince C runs over and he takes over some territory, he gets some of my soul. And I was down in the depths, I was almost down for the count, and then some way I bounced back. And then I ran over and I took over some of the, my, my territory back. <laughs> but across the hall of years, some things that strike you as funny. I don't get a whole lot better, and I don't get a whole lot worse. <laughs> then you can look out upon the complete genetic history of humanity. Couch it in spiritual, political, economic, nationalistic terms, and you got the same thing. Looked at as all of life being engaged and based upon a struggle between these two principalities, things do not drastically change. There seems to be a kind of equalization of power, and it seems to temporarily go through this and that, but it doesn't mean anything. And nobody is allowed to be curious because it is not, of course, a simple collusion between, as your fathers and forefathers would have, it is not a simple two-dimensional collusion between God and Satan, between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Because to begin with, if I even were going to use such terms, we're still leaving out one-third. Remember, we're leaving out another prince that has an equal amount of power. But the point, if we just take it right now on the basis of these two principalities, you and this other thing in you, no matter what it's called, people are not allowed to even find it curious that this struggle is not what everybody believes it is. It is not death-defying. It is a whole bunch of the armies of Prince C, and they don't know any better. They're not in on it. He does something to them. He works them up into a frenzy. He claims that they're fifth columnists and spies at work. He claims he has information that tomorrow morning D is going to attack us and kill all of our children and rape all of our women, at least the good-looking ones. <laughs> and so he gets all these soldiers to rush up, screaming, hollering, frightened, some of them knowing they're going to die, rush up to the border to Prince D. When Prince C made it all up, Prince C and D had sat down and discussed it two months ago, maybe two years ago. They even gave a guesstimate as to how many we're going to lose on each side, how much is it going to be worth, how long we should let it go on before we pull back, how many people are we, each one of us should we lose before it becomes unprofitable. Whoever loses the most, they work out a program, then you retract first, you retreat. But the people involved, to them, it is do or die. But at the binary level, nobody has ever allowed the privilege to even be aware of the fact that it seems to be that way in me all the time, and in others. They talk about it. They write dramas about it. What are all movies? What are all books? All plays? What is gossip about? So about one of the two characters in front of this real crude background, this repetitious, boring, slapdash background, it's one of two characters, one of two, the armies of one of two kingdoms rushing up right to the level and shaking, rattling their sabers, screaming insults, about to wet their pants, afraid they're going to die, and it seems to be do or die. This seems to be serious business indeed, but if it's so serious, how come nobody ever wins? Why, at the most, is there a sensation of awareness up and down a little bit, and it always bounces back with some kind of unrecognized elasticity, that the situation always goes back to where there's this balance, and nobody seems to notice two months ago. In time, of course, we're dealing with another dimension, but two months, two years, two minutes, this army was prepared to kill the armies of Prince D, both out there and in you. And suddenly, two minutes later, you can't remember what it was about. When the armies of Prince D holler, we will not give an inch, I'll do this or we'll die. Two minutes, two weeks, two days, two years, two eons, two peons later, the other side's won, and nobody notices it. You don't notice it. 
somebody points it out to you, you go, oh, never mind that. I forgot about that. I changed my mind. The point is, it seems before the fact and then after the fact, it seems in the speech, in the history, in the retelling, in the imagination of what has happened and what's going to happen, that this battle is serious, that the forces within me, the internal conflicts are serious. They could have absolutely life and death consequences. There's no doubt about it, other than this fact. They don't. But to everybody, they seem like they do. Everybody talks about it. That is the basis of all the great classical literature. The more it seems to be down to the internal conflicts of will true love win out? Or will this person that seemed to be almost driven mad by hubris, by his desire for fame, by the insane dislike for his children, by the envy amongst family members, the more that the conflict seems to be down to a very clear-cut black and white struggle for power, the more likely it is, to put it one way, that you're talking about so-called classical literature, plays, novels, even the way that history is remembered, that it seems to be in given times with given characters, whether it be nations or individual people, that the conflict is one down to a zero game. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. One guy is going to win, he's going to win the heart of the heroine, he's going to win in battle, he's going to slay his opponent on the battlefield, take over the other camps, the other armies, and he be the sole leader, the sole prince. That is the basis of classical literature, that is the basis of classical myths and religions. The gods have got to win but nobody notices they don't ever win. They don't win in the stories. The stories are open-ended. The Christians claim in some way that, well, good is triumph, sort of, because they killed Jesus, and he got and said, ha-ha, I ain't dead, and he left. <laughs> but notice, that's just one example that's true with all religions. There is no fini, an actual one, at the end of the holy book. If there was, you'd read the whole holy book, and in some way, you simultaneously reading the final words, the final <laughs> chapter of the holy book would have to be the final days for you because it had to be, all this happened. Two or three, four thousand pages, Koran, the Old Testament, whatever, but you have to get the last page and it says, and then, whatever they call their gods, their god says, hey, I've had it, and he took the anti-gods, and he cut their necks off, and he threw them away, and uh, they shipped them off somewhere else, and they rotted, and then all the good guys went, yay, and we all lived happily ever after. Of course, simultaneously, that would happen in your life. But the internal conflict, everything would be gone. But notice, it doesn't happen. It does not even happen in print. The gods never win. It's always, well, things are getting better. They're looking up. <laughs> Prior side. Really? If things changed that much since Abraham's time, Adam's time, since the Chinese claimed that they'd figured out that you know, the universe was supported by a turtle standing on top of another turtle. <laughs> We've added, what, 77,000 generations, that is 7,000 turtles since then. Is it getting any shakier? Are turtle poachers taking over? Life seems to be a death or do or die proposition. And I, many people, when they're first exposed to what I've been doing, and some of you, they'll get this later on tape, if you go back and try to pick up some people, as I have noted and admitted you, find the way I've done it and some of the things I've talked about that sounds at first blush to be harsh, uncaring. You know, we, I don't seem to worry enough about people's problems. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you are right. <laughs> because you don't understand what the problems are. Everything else serves its purpose. Those who need a kind of sandy path mystical school, a religion that is comforting. <coughs> if you still need your parents, if you need somebody to say, yeah, life is a bitch, and then you die. But thank God, thank God, we've got this teaching here that tells us that although life's a bitch and then we die, later on it'll be all right. Right now what we've got to do is find some temporary comfort, if not surcease, of this suffering that we don't deserve that is based upon the conflict between that which is proper and that which is improper. Looked at another way, 
for those that ever make it that far. What seems to be suffering is truly having your brain pinched by ignorance. <laughs> it's you're trying to think of this complete pie. You're trying to perceive all of life, including yourself, which would be, I suggest to you, I sure as hell didn't draw it good, did I? That is what everyone is trying to perceive. That's what everyone else wants to call a mystical experience, an awakened state, a blown away condition. But the pain, what everybody calls suffering, now identifies I'm not loved, my nose is too big, I'm misunderstood, I'm not appreciated. And I'm suggesting to you the pain comes from only being conscious there. But as far as you can tell from all ordinary means, that's everything. That is everything. That is the principality of C and D. That's everything you've been taught was right and wrong, everything that you feel is right and wrong, everything that you perceive to be true and false. But it creates in an unrecognized manner. I'm probably the only physician, well I am as a matter of fact, that understands it exactly in this way right now. It creates, I don't get too technical on you, so uh, you can probably follow this. Some of you have already had some undergrad pre-med, or at least biology. <laughs> it, it makes your little brain hurt. It get, it, you get pinched in here, but you're trying to perceive something that would be like a pie divided into three, and no matter what you do, you can only see two slices out of it, and it makes you, you hurt. <laughs> it's like having a little brain pain. But it comes out as, I misunderstood, I want to do right, and the gods won't allow me to see all the mystical things. Uh, I'm basically a good person, but I've been mistreated by women. I'm basically a good person, but uh, I'm the only men that are attracted to me are one-legged bricklayers that live in house trailers. I could have been a good person, but then my mother and father died before I knew enough to tell them that everything was okay. There. It's little brain aches. Everyone is wired up to believe. It's way beyond yellow circuit, even though I say believe. There is a raging conflict within me and without. It's everywhere. But you do not ever notice that the conflict not only is never ending, but there is no great shift of power. And it's almost impossible to entertain the notion that there could be a collusion between these two forces. The collusion being that there has to be a third background upon which they all operate. Another way of putting it, the collusion being that the princes C and D, they can't meet when they have to have their periodic meetings. C can't show up over in D's. He can't run the rest no matter how he, if he disguised himself as Carmen Miranda, there's always a chance if C slips into D's kingdom, somebody's going to see it, and then the whole game is over. <laughs> they have to meet over at E's place. <laughs> and of course, the only way that works is all the people in the two kingdoms, the people that live in the kingdom of C, as far as they know, there's only two kingdoms on this planet. That's theirs and D's. And same about the people in D's. They could not meet were it not for E having a palace. And they could not meet in safety and carry on this alleged collusion if anybody in the people in C and D knew about it. Nobody would put up with that, would they? You're that reasonable. Would you go off and be prepared to join up and fight some other country, Russia, or some other time somebody else, if you found out that the president of your country and the premier of Russia were getting together in Finland, or Estonia, Albania? <laughs> That three times a year, they were getting together, call girls, booze, cigars, <laughs> porno movies, or reruns of Green Acres and Get Smart. <laughs> that they were buddies. I mean, they're, in fact, they're beyond buddies. You can't even comprehend. Here it is, the two strongest men in the world. It's not they're just buddies. You might even find out that it's somewhat like the nature of royalty in Europe. You, know, you find out 
even back during World War I, that the people fighting each other. The kings of Germany were brother-in-laws of the kings and queens of England and Italy. They also intermarried and to think, well, they're all fighting each other. You know, they were sometimes first cousins. So you can't just say they're friends, but who would put up, who would go fight a war if you find out the premier of your country, your prince, and then the prince of your hated enemy, the one whose religion, the one whose political system, their color, their race, their nationality, their habits, their culture, was just at absolute loggerheads with yours. They were obviously a lower sort, a cruder sort, the kind that's got to be banished from the earth or at least keep kept from any position of power. And to find out that your prince, the guy that hollers, all right, who's ready to fight and you would have given your life, you find that him and the prince of the other thing, are, it's beyond buddies. You came, comp they may be brothers and nobody knew it. No reasonable person, which I'm sure, it's the kind of people I'm addressing here and now, Nobody, as Winston Churchill, if I may paraphrase him, that's the kind of shit up with which I shall not put. Nobody would, would they? But even if it was true, please note, there's no danger because nobody can see it. I'm going to cut it and there'll be an epilogue task for those for whom it's appropriate. For those of you in the other cities right now uh, that qualify for the task, you're supposed to be the only ones even hearing these epilogues, I've got two tasks. One is for you people individually, I want you for the next week to listen to everyone else talking in the world all the way from uh, movies, to the news, people being interviewed, or if you want to really be hardworking, skip all that and deal with ordinary life or what you're surrounded by. And here's what I want you to look for. If I had noted for you that almost all of human verbal intercourse, all of conversation could be divided into people complaining or explaining what they've done. If I said that as a kind of verbal challenge, what I want you to do for the next week is I want you to find me five examples wherein somebody talking that you listen to. Now bypass, don't waste our time with somebody giving direct, minimal, hard information. Such as somebody says, hey, does the Crosstown bus stop here? And the guy says, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be beyond direct, apparent, communicate of some factual information that can be done in monosyllables almost, so forget that. Something that qualifies as real human conversation. I want you to listen. You got one week, and I want you to find me five examples wherein somebody who was talking, what they were saying did not fall into the classification that they were either complaining or explaining, that is, explaining what they, what they had done, why they did it what they thought about, what motivated them. Don't you find five examples of people engaged in real human conversation and examples being five times wherein you heard someone who was either not complaining or not explaining. Find me five examples. Then I want you to double check it. I want you to think about it again and make sure you got five examples. <laughs> now I've got some of you people uh, this is epilogue 2, June 1986, for you people left right now in New York, the real group, the heart of the group in New York, and you people in Los Angeles. I want you to do something. We're having either tonight, along with the tapes, or within the next few days, some music sound, a Bach, a piece of Bach. As I want you people, uh, do your best. In New York, we've got some people who are musicians, and we've got a few out in California. No illusionary struggle for power, just whoever seems to know the most about music, one or more of you, take this music, and I want you to get together and practice. Take everybody that's part of the more or less permanent group there in New York and Los Angeles, and divide up the parts, 
as best you can, and I want you to learn to sing this, and I'm going to be in New York and Los Angeles, both my plan is, shortly, before the summer's out, the next month or two months. And I want you to work on it and be able to sing it. And if some of you absolutely have no voice, just that you can't hear one note from another, don't suffer over it, don't give me that, but don't run yourself into the ground. If you realize you can't sing, or on the contrary, or on the other hand, if everybody but you understands you can't sing, <laughs> face up to it, Bucky, and don't. Go ahead and join in. Try and practice and see if you can develop it, see if you get any better. But if you really can't do it, you don't have to interfere with everyone else singing when I come out to hear it. But I want you to be able to do it. So amongst yourselves, just pick out who's sort of in charge, who seems to know the most about music. It's a box piece and divide it up. Other than that, I'm going to leave it to you, but I want you to be able to sing it within, we'll say, the next five weeks. I want you to have it down that you can sing it through. And once you hear this, be sure that this part gets erased from all tapes, the second epilogue. 